This week, the verdict from Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer, and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010. And now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. I'm slightly embarrassed to tell you something that happened when this building was first opened. My friends established it here at the University of Moratua near Colombo, and it's rather important to me, not merely because of the name. The Clark Center will provide facilities for training and research in modern technologies, especially satellite communications. The Big Dish is receiving television signals from all over the world. So this is a center for modern science. Yet the auspicious time for the opening ceremony was decided not by the university authorities, but by the local astrologers. This kind of insurance, a bow to the forces of the supernatural, is part of the Sri Lankan way of life. Although, of course, I don't believe in it, I find it rather charming. And it's certainly given me an opportunity to study belief in the supernatural at first hand. Two of Sri Lanka's most popular fortune tellers work in this crowded street in Colombo. They're called Raja and Rani, and as you'll see, they're rather colorful characters. Uh, will you ask him to tell me my fortune? Yes, sir. Our Nairangala father's selling one rupee. Oh, one rupee, that seems very reasonable. Okay, here we go. Your uh, uh, business and your job, you will be success. My business will be successful, yeah. right? Uh, uh, there are no enemies for you. I have no enemies. Yeah. Oh, that's very nice to know. Uh, uh, in your business, hey. you will get a good profit. Yeah, I get a good profit from my yeah. business. Well, that's nice to know. Are the parents ever wrong? Uh, ever make a mistake? Correct. And that was the political thing, man. Get that. In the last few years. After that, we have been doing it. 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 Colombo's main business and shopping district, Miss Kasala Gunaratna has a steady stream of clients at her pavement stall. A respected astrologer and palmist, she's so popular that there's always a queue for her readings. And what kind of questions do they usually ask? Good afternoon. You are with the Adalin. I have a question on very important married life, future, financial situation, and career. Employment. Career employment. employment. What is the basis of the calculations? Is it uh, star positions or what? Oh, yeah. Planets. Planets. Did, did she ask them their date of birth? She asked them the date of birth? Date of birth and time I want exact. You want the time exact time? Yes. How many people know the time of birth? I don't. Ninety uh, percent. Of course, in this country, they do remember the date, the actual time, because of this. Yes. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. I'm on my way to a rather unusual fortune teller, and I have to count every step I take, because my future literally depends upon it. Nine, 
60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Mr. Ginadasas, a numerologist, he uses numbers to tell fortunes. Each letter of the alphabet has an equivalent number, so he uses his customer's name and address, as well as his birth date and the size of his family, to make his predictions. Even the number of steps from the house has a fateful significance in the mathematical magic. 49, 50, 51, 52. 552. 552. That's right. We the interpretation of 552. I'll work, out, work it out and let you know. Yes. Now, what, what else do you need? 5, 10, 12, 3 denotes Jupiter. Jupiter denotes success with increase and expansion. Great hopes will be realized. Good efforts will be rewarded. May I know the name of the town in which you reside? Well, I live in Colombo. Colombo. We'll work out Colombo and see. Three, seven, three, seven, four, uh, two, seven, ten, thirteen, twenty, twenty four, twenty six, twenty six, 7, 33. 3 and 3, 6. 6, right. six denotes Venus. A happy result to all efforts. Success with pleasure and contentment. Personal magnetism. Favors from the members of the opposite sex and matrimonial prospects. So oh, yeah. by number six, Thanks uh, for the warning. In Sri Lanka, marriages are literally made in heaven, or at least in the stars. Partners are found through advertisements in the Sunday papers. They offer descriptions and dowries, but most vital of all in the eyes of the Sri Lankans is a favorable horoscope. Devapriya's advertisement in the Sunday Observer has been answered by Champika. Champika's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Amara Singer, have called in the family astrologer. The marriage will not go ahead if their horoscopes are incompatible. If the given conditions do not come up to about 50% of the required standard, we consider the horoscope below average. If that is so, the astrologer doesn't recommend that the marriage should take place. It has to be that way. Uh, even uh, if it causes distress to my daughter, if the horoscopes don't agree, we will have to call it off. The indicator of the house of marriage in the girl's chart, which is Jupiter, is not occupies, occupying the seventh house, but it occupies the ascendant. Now, this particular planet has to be compared with the boy's horoscope. Jupiter, which will aspect the solar sign from its eleventh house position, also harmonizes the house of marriage. Therefore, I, we consider that this the, the, the boy's chart and the girl's chart are in perfect harmony for marriage. The astrologer has given me at least 99% of confidence, and the other 1% is left to the, the bride and the bridegroom to make their own life, and we are quite confident that they will do it. The astrologer has determined the auspicious time for every stage of the wedding ceremony. Bride left her home at exactly 8.07 in the morning, facing south. Two hours and 20 minutes later, and not a moment before, at 10.27, the bride and groom climbed onto the stage for the beginning of the ceremony. And they couldn't come down again until 10 past 11. <laughs> Then they had to leave the reception for their honeymoon, facing south and married life together. There's one peculiarity that distinguishes 
parascience from science. In orthodox science, it's very rare for a controversy to last more than a generation, 50 years at the outside. Yet this is exactly what's happened with the paranormal, which is the best possible proof that most of it is rubbish. It never takes that long to establish the facts when there are some facts. This lack of progress in psychic research is very well demonstrated in the work of a famous British investigator, Harry Price. 50 years ago, he tried to find some answers. In the 1920s and 30s, Harry Price investigated a vast range of apparently psychic phenomena. He tested mediums like Austrian Rudi Schneider, broadcast from haunted houses, and even spent a night in a reputedly haunted bed with radio personality Professor Jode. He assembled a lab full of the latest technology to help him in his search for the truth. If a man comes to us and says that he can produce abnormal uh, phenomena, then we test him by instrumental means. We have a number of special instruments for this purpose, including a dictaphone, a cinematograph projector and cameras, X-ray apparatus, infrared, ultraviolet, and many others. Borley Rectory in Suffolk provided Price with his most famous case. He called it the most haunted house in England. Readers of Price's best-selling books lapped up accounts of the phantom nun and the headless coachman said to have been seen in the rectory garden. And the Foister family, who lived at Borley in the 1930s, apparently played host to a ghost, which left eerie messages for Marianne, the rector's wife. Fire wrecked Borley in 1939. Today, Price's work has become controversial. Some experts accuse him of trickery to embellish the story. Others say Borley harbored genuine hauntings. But no one disagrees that Harry Price's most extraordinary escapade was purely a publicity stunt. In June 1932, a bizarre ritual was performed on the summit of the Brocken, a German mountain. Price claimed he'd found an ancient magic recipe. A maiden, pure in heart, was one essential ingredient. With her help, Price promised he'd transform a virgin he-goat into a handsome youth. But the outcome was typical of Price's paranormal progress, ultimately inconclusive. I've always tried to steer a course between skepticism and credulity. And to help me do this, I've constructed this scoreboard or league table on which I've rated various paranormal phenomena. It begins at plus five, certainly true, and then descends to zero, meaning that I just don't know. Then as I become more skeptical, I have negative numbers down to minus four, certainly untrue. Although you can prove that something happens, you can never prove that it doesn't. Only God is qualified to give a minus four rating. So let's have a look at the league table. We'll start with firewalking. Plus five. There's no doubt that firewalking really does occur. People do walk on red hot coals. And scientists have given very good reasons why they don't get burnt. Maledictions, plus four. I'm virtually certain that Maledictions, hexes, can kill. The medical evidence seems unassailable. People really do die because they believe in the power of the hex. Stigmata, plus four. I'm also prepared to believe that people can psych themselves into bleeding from the palms of the hands. Though how this actually works is very hard to understand. Apparitions, plus four. Ghosts are the most fascinating of all paranormal phenomena, you may be surprised that I give them such a high rating. But I believe they're real enough to the witnesses. And I see him from his knees, and I followed, followed him upwards, and it was like a monk stood there with a robe over his face, but he never had no features. But are they real to anyone else? The abysmal quality of the photographic evidence virtually proves that they're not. Poltergeists. 
I'm fascinated by poltergeists because there are so many independent yet similar accounts from all over the world. And despite all the explanations and hoaxes, I think there may still be something in them. Dowsing is so useful that it ought to work, and in some cases it certainly does. But why are the scientific tests always so unconvincing? I'd like to see a lot more work in this area. Many people believe in telepathy, but do we really want strangers peering into our minds? More prehistoric jungle scenes. For... I rather hope that it doesn't work, but I fear that it may. I just had this dream about this plane crash. And there was this explosion. Some stories of premonitions are almost convincing, but I still believe they can be explained by coincidence or awareness of some impending danger. I don't believe that we can see the future because the future doesn't exist until we reach it. Psychokinesis, zero. PK is under a considerable cloud, but can it all be trickery? Frankly, I can't make up my mind. You're now psychically open, and remember, you have to bring that power up each time. Survival after death, minus two. Reincarnation and spiritualism have millions of devotees whose faith brings them great comfort. So though I'm a complete skeptic, I don't wish to argue the point. So here's the complete league table. Weighing the evidence for the supernatural can be difficult at the best of times. And occasionally, psychic researchers come across stories that just don't fit into any categories. They're simply weird. In the late 1940s, the Reverend Alfred Biles was vicar of this church at Yampton in Devon. One Saturday afternoon, he noticed something strange in the churchyard. My wife was in the chancel arranging flowers, and I came to see her, walked up this path. And when I came to this point, I found that there was a hole in the path which extended from right across and about that a yard or two that way. I merely thought that, that there had been a subsidence and uh, I went into the church and said to my wife, a hole has appeared in the path, which is very annoying. Come out and see. Uh, so uh, she came out with me and in that short time, the hole had become considerably larger and I uh, said to my wife, shall I get down and look round it? She said, I shouldn't do that. We can't really see the bottom, nor we could. Mr. Biles went to find some planks to cover the hole, and in the village street, he bumped into the local builder. I told him what had happened, and we came round the corner of the church to this path. But when we got here, there was no hole at all. The uh, path was quite intact, exactly as you see it now. I don't suppose I should have said much about it if I hadn't had my wife's... Uh, corroboration, we both of us saw the original hole and uh, we never found any adequate explanation. In October 1979, Jeff Simpson and Len Gisby were driving through France on the way to Spain with their wives, Pauline and Cynthia. They spent a night near Montelimar. Down the road from the Motel Ibis, they found a guest house which seemed to belong to a bygone age. It's just a, like an old-fashioned farmhouse, double-story effort. The bar was old-fashioned, they had pictures on the wall, you know. They so looked no 3D, glass. didn't they? Well, yeah. some of them. No yeah, glass. there were no glass on them. We were laughing at the pictures, yeah. weren't we? <laughs> and the furniture in the bedroom was so old-fashioned. I think mean, you sat on the bed and your feet were about 18 inches off the floor, you know, and calico sheets, well... Yes, the sheet was very heavy and thick and it came from under the feather mattress right over the sheet and rolled round a bolster at the top. There was no um, pillars. There, there was no pillars and uh, the rooms were double shuttered, no glass upstairs. At breakfast, Cynthia noticed the other guests wore clothes fashionable at the beginning of the century. And there was a woman and a, and a man with a little dog sitting at the table and she had a purple dress on that went up and down like a hanky corner, you know, oh, and she had little black button boots that come up over her ankles with the buttons running up to the top. And they were sitting there talking, obviously, about various things, and these two gendarmes came in 
happened. I'd never seen the uniforms like that before. They were different to the uniforms we'd seen coming down. You know, they were, well, I always said they were a greeny colour, and I think you said Well, I they thought were they were blue. more a blue. But, I, I, but they were old-fashioned, so old, with they these cape, big capes, they? and the hats were very, very tall. And they had boots up yeah, to the knee, the, didn't the they? old gator things. I went to pay the bill then, and uh, he, said it was... he wrote it on a piece of paper, 19 francs. I thought it was impossible. We'd had an evening meal for four of us. We'd had beer, uh, beer, beer, yeah, plenty of beer, and um, the continental breakfast, and, and 19 sleep. francs. So uh, no, I said no. Uh, we sh she I said the night, we slept uh, last the night. night, you know. Uh, no, no, no Finny. I said well, I can't argue. You know, I gave him 20 francs, and we went. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but 19 francs is impossible. Because, um, I don't know, it's you even went back. I, I, I said, said to you, come on, about, let's get out quick. Yeah, I reckon about 200, <laughs> 250 yeah. francs or something like that, you know. The Gisbys and the Simpsons drove on into Spain. They'd never had a better holiday. Everywhere, their cameras clicked. They brought back albums full of snaps, but not a single shot of the French hotel. Both Len and Jeff took pictures there. But when the films were processed, the hotel snaps had vanished without trace. And on the way back, they could not even find the building. Had they stayed at a phantom hotel? They're still looking for it. Perhaps the police can help. Hotel. 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 Yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you, I've an idea. I'm going to call the office of the tourism. Oh, yeah. Oh, the tourist yeah. office. Yeah. The helpful gendarme knows just the man to ask. The local tourist board officer, Philippe Hello? Despes. L'office of the tourism. We're interested whether it's there or not, you know. Yeah, it seems to have disappeared. Or if it had been there at any time. Or people yeah, tell yeah. us we've gone back in time because everything yeah. was old fashioned. You know, and, uh, we're just trying to find it. Philippe thinks he can solve their problems. Their description seems to fit one of the guest houses on his list. <laughs> Jeff Simpson's first reactions encouraging, but then the doubts set in. Let's have bigger doors. Bigger doors. It's very, very similar. No, it was longer, lower. Yeah. It had, yeah, it, had, two, it had two windows two there windows for the restaurant. Yeah, even the shutters are not the same. A close up look convinces them it's not the place they stayed in. And the landlord doesn't remember them sampling his hospitality before. Come on, pull in that garage and get out the car. I have a funny feeling. Yes, I've seen, I've seen your, your face. Mm. You were looking strange when, when you got out of the car. I thought it was next door, and that bit of ground there, I could have sworn that was where it was. That empty piece yes, of ground. Yes, that, that's a ground. ground. It, it could be. Wall opposite wow. I think it this is, is the wrong is house, and we've well, got to well, carry well, on well, searching. Well, I'm well, afraid. Well, yes. <laughs> Were they caught up in a time slip? And a lot of people have sent to me since about time slips. I said, well, I've never heard about time slips. And they said, oh, there is such things, and then we reckon that's what you've done. But whether we did or not, I don't know. But the photographs worry me, and I think that alone convinces me that there is something not right. I would like proof that some strange powers exist then the universe would be even more wonderful than we imagine. But I rather suspect that this ancient debate will never be settled. It will simply move on into different areas because there are fashions in parapsychology as in everything else.
and I wonder what strange powers we'll be arguing about a hundred years from now.